I'm Lynn Smith, and welcome to The Bigfoot Project. My name is Mike. I grew up in the Pacific Northwest. We lived in a great little town back then called Maple Valley in Washington State. Our neighborhood was located next to Shadow Lake. Me and my buddies loved the woods and the lake. I had a couple of experiences I can think of. Back then, we just thought, who knows what that was? We just had a short attention span, but now, when I hear the stories on your site, I think, dang, that's what happened to us. I was in junior high, so it was between 1978 and 79. My first experience was pretty brief. Me and my friends were in the woods and not far off the main road into our neighborhood, probably less than 50 feet, but we were just goofing around, looking at where we could build a tree fort or something dumb. Anyway, out of nowhere, something or someone started throwing rocks at us. Not big rocks, just little rocks, but I can remember how they zinged past us, maybe two or three times. Us being young, dumb kids, we just picked up our own rocks and threw some back in the direction we thought someone was throwing rocks at us. Not nearly as powerful. My second experience was a little more detailed. I know I was in the seventh grade. Me and my other buddy named Mike had gotten into his dad's homemade wine, and after that we wanted to know how to make our own. So at school, we asked our science teacher how was wine made. He told us it took fruit, sugar, water, hops, and whatnot. Well, we thought we had it all figured out, and we knew what we needed to do. So one weekend, we talked his older brother into going out into the woods with us to pick some huckleberries. Well, one weekend, it had to be in spring, we went down this old power line road that we were very familiar with and came across this massive huckleberry bush. The berries were huge, and the bush was growing out of the top of this old massive stump. One of those old stumps you would see in a picture that ten people with their arms together stretched around would barely reach around. Here's where things got scary. We were all happy picking these huge huckleberries and stuffing them in our mouths when all of a sudden someone started throwing big, and I mean big rocks at us. Rocks that were probably bigger than our heads. I can distinctly remember the sound of the rocks coming through the tops of the trees, breaking branches, cracking, thudding as they hit the ground at our feet. At first we just thought, who's throwing rocks at us? Then we realized, who can throw rocks that big? And then we thought, who can throw rocks that big across the tops of trees? We all looked at each other and knew it was time to get the heck out of there. We ran out of there as fast as we could. And it gets better. After we ran and made it to the main road, we talked to each other and just decided it was probably older teenagers that were just messing with us and trying to scare us and we knew that we needed to get back to that huckleberry bush to get what we needed to make our wine. The plan was, the next weekend, we would go berry picking. The following weekend came, and my two friends had to go to town with their parents, so this left only me to go pick the huckleberries by myself. Convinced that the rock-throwing event was just someone trying to scare us, I decided it was no big deal, and I'd go and get all the berries we needed. I had a large bowl and started my way down the power line road into the woods, I wasn't far down the road, maybe a hundred feet in, and I heard something rustling on my right side. Not wanting to be alarmed, I brushed it off as a small animal or something. I came across this small huckleberry bush with small berries, and I thought this was a good place to start getting some berries. And as I was picking, I hear this loud knock on a tree, and it was three distinct knocks. I remember it like it was yesterday. And again, not trying to be alarmed, I tell myself it's probably just a woodpecker. Don't be a scaredy cat. You need to get to that stump and get to the good huckleberries. So I make my way back to the stump with the huge huckleberries that we found the previous weekend, and I'm picking away, my bowl is filling up. This bush is the jackpot of huckleberries, and we are on our way to having the best huckleberry wine ever made. And then I hear something. At first, I hear what was just some rustling around in the dry leaves and I can hear it a little ways off the other side of the stump. Again, not wanting to be alarmed, I convince myself it's probably another small animal rummaging around. I try to focus on picking the huckleberries, but I can clearly hear whatever is on the other side of this stump is getting closer, and my heart is starting to beat a little faster. My focus on picking berries has now been redirected to the sound of crunching leaves on the other side of the stump, and I can clearly hear that it's not just something rustling around. I can hear footsteps. Crunch, crunch, crunch. 
and it's coming towards me. Within a few seconds, whatever it is, is directly on the opposite side of the stump for me. My heart is about to explode out of my chest. My hands are trembling, and I don't want to know what it is. So I make myself walk away, never turning back to look and see what's there. I walk as fast as I can back down the trail I came in on. Was it the same person or thing that was throwing massive rocks at us the previous weekend? I don't know. Was it a Bigfoot? I don't know. I was really afraid for my life. A part of me wishes I would have looked, but at the same time, I couldn't. I've told other people about this event that happened to me, and I've been laughed at, and I've had people ask me what I thought it was. I even had one guy, Steve, try to convince me I was abducted by aliens. <laughs> that was a stretch. Do the Bigfoots really exist? I don't know, but my experience compared to the other stories I've heard, and actually having rocks thrown at me in the woods, maybe they do. A Long, Long Look at a Bigfoot by Vance Orchard Except for the 1967 filming by Roger Patterson, there's not much to support belief in the existence of a Bigfoot, other than the telling of experiences by persons claiming to have seen one. And there are thousands of such experiences that will fill books on the subject. A lot of those experiences have come in recent years from the Blue Mountains, and especially in the high country, just a few miles east of Dixie a town of a couple hundred people on U.S. Highway 12, some 10 miles east of Walla Walla. This column has recounted many of those stories, related by the observers, and they are part of the cloth into which is woven this documentation for a Bigfoot in these parts. We have interviewed many who were firm disbelievers before their experience, but are now firmly entrenched on the side of the believers in this creature. A most unique interview was done when Bill Lafferty and Vance Orchard met the man who had a long, long look at one and right up close. The distance separating man and beast was close enough that features and expressions on the Bigfoot's face were plain for the observer. Bill had heard of the man's encounter and convinced him he should tell it for a reporter to do a story. Convincing the man to meet us on the Black Snake Ridge Road recently was not easy, but the story needed telling, so he agreed. But no name, the man asked, recounting some of the ridicule he had received when a story of his encounter leaked to his buddies. So we've gone along with that, and he suggested the nickname of Jack the Logger. What Jack had to say about the Bigfoot he met on the mountain road with a truckload of logs makes for one of the best Bigfoot stories I've yet recorded. His trip that afternoon off the mountain, headed towards Dixie, was to prove the highlights for Jack of some 45 years of trucking logs, Jack probably knows more about Black Snake and Biscuit Ridges than most people. He said he makes two or three trips per day when he's hauling logs, and this counts a lot of days when he has to put on chains at the top and take them off when he gets out of snow. And Jack could probably give a good count of deer and elk in those parts as well. But these days, ever since the late November of 1998, he's been eyeing the landscape for Bigfoot. Jack first spotted the Bigfoot when it was seen on an open slope some three-fourths of a mile away, but he didn't realize what the moving object was. Jack says he estimated about where on the road he would likely cross its path. At that time, I'm wondering what kind of animal it was. He said, it never entered my mind that it was going to be a Bigfoot. As his rig came into the curve at the end of a long grade in the road, the two met, with only about 40 to 45 yards separating them. As I got there and saw him, Jack said, I stopped my truck and shut off the motor. He was standing there in a heavy, tufted, grassy area, just standing and looking at me. And we both eyed each other real good. Pretty soon, I was close enough I could see his facial expressions. He didn't look like an ape in the face, more like man features, but hairy in the face. I would say he had a nose, but not much. The skin was black, and his hair color was like this and he pulls out a smoky blue ski hat out of his truck cab. He was about this color and had gray hairs showing like an old dog will get around his nose. Anyway, while he was standing there, the expression on his face changed three or four times. That led me to believe that man may not be the only animal that has reasoning. This old boy was thinking, and every time he'd go to a different train of thought, his expression would change. Bill asked if Jack could see its eyes. I really wasn't interested in that, Jack said. 
I was looking at the width of his shoulders and his height, wondering what the hell was going to happen. How wide was the Bigfoot? He was a good yard or more through the shoulders, and I've had people tell how a Bigfoot is about eight feet tall. Well, this dude was taller than eight feet and closer to nine feet tall. When you're that close, it's no problem to figure out how big it was. And he never made an effort to run from me. He never acted like he was scared. I sure know he wasn't scared of me, not a bit. Then he turned and walked along, this way. Jack simulated a limping gait, like something was wrong with one of his legs. Like he had an old injury or someone had shot him. Then he stopped and turned and looked at me for another full minute before he left. Didn't run, he just walked over to the edge of the brush that dropped off steeply into the Dry Creek North Fork. There was no getting around it. This was not any man-made object or a man dressed up. There isn't a man in this country big enough to wear that suit. Jack says this sighting was his first Bigfoot encounter, although several years ago he saw something. I always thought it was a Bigfoot, but I could find no sign. But this time it's different. Absolutely no doubt about it. I would pull $50 out of my own pocket, though, if one of you guys could have been there with me. Jack told us more about his initial reluctance to come forward with a report of what he encountered nearly two years ago. I don't know whether to say anything to anyone about this, you know. If I'd go downtown and tell the guys I'd saw a Bigfoot, they'd laugh me clear out of the place. I told my wife about it, and she kind of had her doubts about it for a while, but she knew I wasn't going to come in with some kind of cock and bull story to take a ridiculing over. But I really don't care what people think. I just don't talk about it except with someone who has seen a Bigfoot or is a serious believer. They can believe what they want, but I'm the one who knows what I saw. They can say there is no such thing, but they don't have anything to back that up, and I do. This thing was the closest to a real human than anything I've seen on television or in real life. His body is proportioned more to a human than anything I've ever seen. He's not like an ape. This dude walked like a man and somehow acts like a man. He walked like he was crippled in the right leg or foot. I'll tell you this much, too. I've never seen anything like it before or since. He's one of a kind for me. So the interview ended that sunny day on Black Snake Ridge. Jack climbed in his log truck cab to head into the timbered country for his second trip of the day. As he stepped into his cab, I heard him shout back to us, Keep your eyes open, kids. At least there's two of you. You can back up each other's stories. Thanks for joining me on the Bigfoot Project. I think you might find this video of interest as well. If you have a story you would like to share here, you can email me, Lynn Smith, at thebigfootproject at mail.com.